Hey, good morning. Welcome to North Bridge Community Church. So glad you're here. Let's stand and worship. Oh, my. 
Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we always want to give a moment during our worship to encourage our, our, our gathering and our people around giving and, and just get encouraged about what we get to give to. That's what, that's what excites me the most is that uh, what I get to give to around here. And you don't always hear the stories, and so we're trying to do a better job of letting you know what's going on and, and, what's, and what God is doing. And, and Derek's story comes to mind when I think about what I get to give to you. Uh, Derek has a riddled past. Uh, he's usually usually here second service, uh, but he knows, uh, actually he knows because he does have a riddled past. He does have uh, times where he's committed felonies. He's got drug addiction in his past. And then now in the present, he's made new, has a new life in Christ, has surrendered his life to Jesus. And made, and, and, and listen, he'll, tell, he'll be the first one to tell you he's not perfect and he's not getting it all perfect. He's not, he's not, not everything. He still messes up from time to time. But, but he's like, but I know I needed to pay the fines. I know I needed to do the time to make things right. And so he spent some time in jail. And then he's like, and now he's out. And he's like, now I want my life to honor and to glorify God. And on April 24th, he's taking his next step in baptism on this stage. And I'm so excited about his story. If you give here, I want to thank you because you give to stories like Derek's. This is what it says in Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up. If you want to be a part of everything God is doing here, if you want to be part of stories like Derek's, there's going to be some ways that come up on the screen. Uh, please, I invite you to be a part of it, especially if you call Northridge home. But just know, it helps my heart to be reminded that God says, I promise you, you keep sowing seeds, I promise you there will be a harvest. There will be stories that come out of it. I'm so excited about that. And speaking of generosity and just encouraging us around generosity, next week, next week's a special day for our house because we actually it's an above and beyond Sunday for us. And if you know anything about uh, what's been going on over the past month or so, uh, we've been in a, in a season of making some, trying to make some goals happen for our church. And two of those goals particularly are to get our environments ready for people that aren't even here yet because we always want to be people. If you're brand new here, we're kind of a we're a group of people that are just like we didn't know if you, if you specifically were going to be here, but we knew God knew you were going to be here, so we want to be ready, right? And another goal that we have is to do something we've never done before, and that's to give away over seventy-five thousand dollars back into the local and global mission uh, initiatives we get to be a part of. We want to invest it right out of this place and go, man. We want to give more than we've ever given before. Well, that's two big-time goals for us. So, so next week. Next week, we're going to have a special time, a special offering that, that's going to help us towards that goal. And I invite you to be a part of that. I invite you to be a part of that with us. God, I pray right now that you just continue to grow our heart towards generosity, towards giving, towards being a church that, that does not look like everything that, that we do is for us and about us. No, no, no. It's everything that we see everything that comes into our life, every bit of money I make and everything that comes into this place. It's actually just something we get to manage and steward and we get to reflect your character in the stewardship of those things. It's something you've blessed us with and it's not ours. We're just managers of it. So we love you. We love you. We love you. And just grow our heart to be a generous church. We pray this in your name. Amen. Every breath that 
Church, let's sing it like we mean it. Your goodness is running out. It's running out. thank you for the breath that you supply that we can use to pour out our praise to you. God, thank you for the goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. God, that you come through for us time and time again. And we know that we can trust you. Even if it's not in our own timing, we know that you're still there and you still have a plan. And God, thank you for what you're teaching us in this series. God, just speak through Johnny today. Open our hearts, open our minds for what you have for us today.
Well, good morning, church. How we doing? Everybody good? Everybody awake? Everybody ready to go? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Hey, we've been in a series where we're looking back into the past and we're pulling out stories uh, that maybe nobody's ever heard of. And so, and it's been fun. But one of the things that you think of when you think of memories and you think of the past, uh, anybody remember memories of the prom? Anybody go to prom or a formal? Right? Anybody remember the really awesome you know, pictures that you took that you look back and go, man, those looked amazing. We looked so good. Anybody have those memories? No, everybody was like, what in the world were we doing? What's my hair doing? It's not, it's out of the picture. Like, it's so big. No. Yeah, we have memories of the prom. And uh, if any, if it, you know, if you've been there before, you know, like, it's pretty, pretty normal stuff goes on as far as like, every, you know, the guys rent the tux, ladies, you buy a dress. Uh, and th- but there's some people that get a little crazy with the outfits, and I want to show you a few outfits this morning to start off. Here's a here's a couple, right? They got matchy really quick, uh, so that that's good. Here's another one for you. Yeah, uh, real shiny, like the gold. Uh, here's a third one. Here's a third one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, anybody anybody have so anybody have, remember? You go, man. Just be real with me, real quick. If you look back on your prom picture and go, "What were we wearing?" Anybody got that? Anybody's like, "What were we wearing?" Okay. Can anybody tell me from these pictures? Does anyone know what they have in common? These three couples that went to prom together. Anybody? Hey, all of them have outfits made completely of duct tape. Of duct tape. <laughs> Like, this is a real thing. This is a real thing. So that, yeah, I, I'm surprised there's like one person each service knew these outfits were made of duct tape. And so the second thing they have in common is actually each of these couples entered into an international prom duct tape outfit competition. It's a real thing. It exists. Uh, I would have never thought of doing this myself, but literally hundreds of thousands of people enter every year. Um, and they use duct tape for this reason. Uh, I believe we use it for everything else. Everybody with me? Right? Even sometimes that we shouldn't use it, we use duct tape for, uh, for lots of reasons. May, you know, and, and some of those reasons, like they're, but they're usually a lot more functional, aren't they? Right? Like there are reasons to use duct tape. Like let's just say you're at the beach and you're like, I don't have any flip-flops, I forgot them. Look, boom, you got flip-flops. Right? It's just that quick, right? Let's just say, you know, you're not at the beach. You're, uh, you're, let's say you're in college, and if you're anything like me, when I was college age, I could not afford a brand new tire. So if I got a flat tire, I got used to plugging my own tire pretty fast. Anybody ever drove around with three plugs in a tire? Don't give me a lecture on how you shouldn't do that. All right? That's just saying. Uh, but there was a place, John C. Used Tire. I'm going to be helpful real, real quick. $25. That's all you need to go there. Cash only. I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm just kidding. All right. That's what I did, okay? And so you drive around, nothing would be aligned. You know, it is what it is, uh, but, you know, the car would drive. All right, let's just say you're in college and you can't afford to get a brand new tire. Guess what, guess what you could use? Duct tape. Look at this. Boom, right? Right, that would make you to your, maybe to your dorm room. Hopefully you live on campus because it's not going to make you very far, right? But let's just say you're out of that season of life. You're a little bit older. You're a young family. Uh, you've got a baby, and the baby's so cute, right? Your family's so cute, and you just love how cute the baby is, and they're so cute how they get into everything. Well, guess what could be very useful if you got a little baby? Look at this, duct tape, all right? Like, I just love for comfort that we have the duck held hostage as well, all right, like next to the baby. It's like, I mean, I'm just, okay, don't advocate. I'm not saying duct tape your baby to the wall, all right, but, you know, take Take it for what it is. Duct tape really does have a lot of uses, and you could probably name a few more. But would the name Vesta Stout ever come to mind? Vesta Stout. No. Someone says, like, no. Vesta Stout. Let's meet Vesta Stout. This is Vesta Stout, and here's her story. She was a mother of two sons that were serving in World War II. She got a job at the Green River Ordnance Plant in Illinois to help with the labor shortage and to help fund and provide what the military needed at the time. Her job there was inspecting and packing cartridges that were used to launch rifle grenades. And these cartridges, different time, right? These cartridges would get shipped out to the soldiers and used in war. So think about that, right? Like this is kind of crazy. A global conflict that you're not on the first line, you're not on the second line. In fact, you don't even see any lines. All you see is the assembly line. All right, that's the only line you have in front of you, but you know if I don't do this right, like what I do gets shipped out to the people that really, really need it. So it's a, it's a big deal, okay? And so these cartridges, they get shipped out to these soldiers and used in war. 
And so for her, it's even bigger deal than just anybody because her sons were in this war. So her son's lives are at stake, and her job was to inspect the packing of what was used countless times to protect and save lives. It's so interesting. She heard from her sons, this is where the story kind of takes a turn, that these cartridges were not working very well. So in, in like in the heat of the moment, like in war, someone would grab a little tab on the side of the cartridge, they would pull it, or on the canister, they would pull it to get the cartridge out of the canister, and, and what would happen is the tab would break. The tab would break in a moment where you needed everything that you needed rested on this tab. And it was like, man, these tabs, they just keep breaking, they just keep breaking. So they, they write her, their mom a letter and say, those aren't, even, those aren't working very well because now if the tab breaks, you need a knife or something to get it out. All the while, people are losing, literally losing their lives. And she, being a mom of two of these sons, thought there's got to be a better way. She thought through it, researched it, thought there's got to be a, 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 a paper-based tape that's waterproof, that's very strong, but could also be torn very quickly and used to help this dilemma so she came up with a solution and passed it up the chain and guess what happened nobody took the idea no one no one listened to her no one took the idea she uh, nobody right like no one knows who this person is writing into the war development department like the place where they're making everything right and this is what she does and she she does what any mom would do in fact if you're a mom in here you'd probably do it and and maybe you're you would probably be like that's exactly what my mom would do cuz in that moment she gets a letter that says it, it, this doesn't make any sense we're not doing it she gets she gets denied and who do, what does she do she gets out a piece of paper she gets out a pen and she writes a guy that we might know Franklin Delano Roosevelt she writes the president of the United States and she says, listen here, president. No, I don't know what she said. I didn't read the letter. But she writes the president. She writes the president. Actually, she's pretty smart because just in, in summary, in summary, she, what she does in the letter is she gives a diagram. She gives a diagram of the canister and of the cartridge. She explains the problem and the solution. And she's very smart because she then appeals to him as a father who also has sons that are serving in the same war. This, she's like, this is a way we can save lives. Not only my son's but also maybe even your son's lives. And so I think this is a big deal. We should look into this idea. Well, that struck a chord with the president because Vesta Stout on March 26, 1943, gets a response letter from the War Production Board in Washington, D.C., saying her idea is amazing, it's been approved, and it's being sent to production. They then enlist a very well-known company named Johnson & Johnson to make the very first duct tape. It worked incredibly and still to this day continues to be used in thousands of different ways, probably ways she never even dreamed we would ever use duct tape. I wonder if anybody who made a duct tape tuxedo this year for, for prom knows that Vesta Stout was written in the background of their story. That the only reason that they were able to enter into the international duct tape prom outfit competition was because Vesta Stout is written into the story and that's how it is. There's a few visible people in every story, but can I tell you, there's a lot of people written in the fine print and in the background of every story, of every story. That's how it is in life. That's how it is in this story, but that's also how it is in the kingdom of God. That's also how it is in the kingdom of God. It's how the kingdom works. There were always a few visible people, and I want to I clarify that. There's always a few visible people. God's always used, when we read in God's word, there's always a few, like we've named Paul off a few times. Paul is this visible leader. There's always a few visible people, but make no mistake about it. It was actually never about a few visible people. It never rested on the gifts and talents of a few visible people. The church isn't built on the gifts and talents of just a few visible people. Our 4JC culture that, 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 is, that we have here doesn't rest on the gifts and talents of a few. Our ministry environments do not rest on the gifts and talents of a few. It's all built on the many saying, I'll do my part. And can I tell you something? When the many go, I'll do my part. I'll take a step in obedience. I'll, I'll make a small sacrifice and do my part. When the many do that, literally the name of Jesus echoes out of this place and begins to impact the community. It was never about a few visible leaders. It was always the many that working behind the scenes, in the background, in the fine print of the stories that we hear. It was always about the many, many in which are in the background. That's the heartbeat of this series. We're kind of, we're bypassing a lot of the heavy hitters. We're bypassing a lot of the heavy hitters and we're looking at people that are written into the background that seemingly might 
seem like nobodies, but God is using in extraordinary ways to build the church. And today's no different. Like I said, we've mentioned Paul's name a lot during the series because he's a key leader in beginning the early church movement. But make no mistake about it, he had many people on the team. So we talked about Tabitha. We talked about Barnabas last week. Barnabas was probably, arguably, Paul's like first team member, first guy on the team. Right, and we don't we don't give him a ton of credit all the time. You may may or may not have heard his name before. We talked about it last week. Go back and listen to. It. I think God could use it in a powerful way. But but Barnabas literally held the door open for Paul's influence and journey to move forward. And out of his journey, the faith, faith spread, the gospel spread, the church grew. And how do we know that the church grew? That we know the church grew because Paul wrote these letters, and these letters ended up in this book. And we know, and then people literally corroborated and, and talked about, and, they, and, they're, and you can take these letters and actually like intersect them with other stories and go, oh, okay, like that's where that happened, and that's where this happened. And then, and then it becomes the Word of God. And so we know all of this through Paul's letters, and, and we start to kind of go towards the, the nobody of today that we're going to talk about today. But I want to first say this. At this. In this time, there wasn't a USPS. There wasn't a postal service, okay? You couldn't just drop off a letter to someone and go, all right, no. But letters were so important because that was the main form of communication in that time. And so what would happen is that he would, you would choose someone that you very much trusted to go with the letter. You choose one, two people. We're going to talk about two people. One in particular because there's two letters you know, that have him in it. And, and so, but, he, but Paul goes, I need, this, I need these letters to go to Colossae. I need him to go to Colossae, and he sends them with a couple of guys, and you see this in Colossians 4, and we're going to find our nobody. So this is what it says in verse 7, Tychicus, which is not our nobody today, but a big part of the story, will tell you all the news about me. Paul's in prison writing this story to the church in Colossae. He says, he's a dear brother, Tychicus is a dear brother and faithful minister, faithful being a word that every one of our extraordinary nobodies have shared in the description uh, when Paul's describing them. A faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances. I want you to know what's going on here. And that he may encourage your hearts. Verse 9, he's coming with, and now here's our nobody, Onesimus. We're going to say this together. You ready? One, two, three. Onesimus. All right? I did like Google how to say that name. I'm just kidding. I knew how to say the name. But he says, our faithful, again, that's a, that's a common theme, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. That's a big deal, by the way. Who is one of you. He's writing to the church in Colossae, and he's like, I want you to know I'm sending this with Onesimus. Tychicus and Onesimus. But Onesimus Unlike Tychicus, Onesimus is one of you, meaning he's from your town. He's a Colossian. He's like, he who is one of you, they will tell you everything that is happening here. They'll let you know what's going on. They'll let you know what's going on with me. They'll let you know go, go what's going on with the church, with the ministry, how it's growing, how you can be encouraged. Yeah, I'm in chains, but I'm writing a lot of letters these days, and I think that's just going to help people. And, and I want to send this letter off with Tychicus and our nobody Onesimus. What do we know about Onesimus? Just from this alone, just from this small passage, we know he's faithful. We know he's worked alongside of Paul, so he's kind of linked together with him for a little bit, and, and he's in the inner circle with Paul. That's all we know from this. But a lot like some other characters in the Bible and the Scriptures, you can, if you dig a little bit deeper, you find some other places where their name exists, you can actually figure out what is their to Onesimus. What's Onesimus is? That's a tough word. Story. And to do some digging, it would help us to know that even in the infancy, infancy of the church, and you can read this in Colossians, because that's what this is about, particularly, like I said, the church in Colossae, which who the letter to the Colossians is for, the church was dealing with some serious issues that Paul wanted to address, particularly two issues, relational friction Ever been there? No? Nobody relates? No, we all, we're all there at the relationship series, so we're all good with that, right? No, relational friction and theological drift. Theological drift, meaning what you believe and it kind of drifting in and out of God's word. Like, 
Do we add stuff to it? Do we take it away? So Paul's like, this is what's going on in Colossians. This is what I've heard going on in Colossians. So I need to address this. I'm going to write some letters guiding and helping navigate this through. And I'm going to send it with Tychicus, and I'm going to send it with Onesimus. They were being influenced theologically by people that were saying things like salvation doesn't just come from faith in Christ alone. It comes from also doing the works of the law, like the Old Testament. He's, he's not saying the Old Testament doesn't matter. But what he's saying, but he was like, in, the, in Colossians, you read it, he's like, no, 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 faith in Christ alone is what you need for salvation. In Col- so this letter is like, oh, okay, we've been dealing with some other things, some other theology, so we actually need to read this letter. It becomes really important. People were teaching that there was a higher secret layer of spiritual knowledge you could get to, like outside of the Word of God, that you could have some illumination into a special group of people. And Paul wanted to debunk that idea, so he uses the letter to Colossians to do that. There were also people teaching the worship of angels, but denying the holiness of Christ and the deity of Christ. And Paul wanted to address and debunk all of this for the emerging church and for the expansion of Christ's message to all of mankind. And all of the sudden... The letter to the church in Colossae becomes really important, doesn't it? Doesn't the value go up when you go, oh, they were dealing with all that? Like they were dealing, they were adding stuff to the teachings and they were taking stuff away from the teachings and and they weren't even, like Jesus wasn't even on, like they weren't even talking about that. They were just talking about angels and they were talking about a special group of people you could be a part of. It it doesn't say it in the Word of God, doesn't say in the Old Testament, doesn't say any of that, doesn't say in the apostles' teachings. No, no, no. It's just something they're making up, and they're like, you could be a part of, you can be illuminated into this group. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. I need to write a letter. I need to help navigate. I need to help guide the church because there's some theological drift going on. And it's a critical letter to Colossians. Can I tell you the same actually, the same thing actually happens to the church today? And so it's not just a critical letter to the church in Colossae. It's a critical letter to the church today, which is why God's like, Bloop, I'm going to put that in my word so that, so that the church, so Paul, through the Holy Spirit, can navigate and help guide the church for thousands of years. So who is Onesimus? Well, like I said from the text, we know he's a brother. We know he's from Colossae. We know he's a Christ follower. Uh, and he's, he, like I said, he said he's one of you, so we know he's from there. So Paul, who's in prison for the gospel, is sending a message, sending a, some letters back to the church to a city far away, and he's sending it back with someone that they may know. He's from there. Onesimus. And here's Onesimus. Here's his background is that he was a slave to a wealthy church leader named Philemon. And we don't, historians say this part, we don't know why Onesimus ran away, but we know Onesimus ran away, so he wasn't a Christ follower. He was a slave to a church leader, which is pretty normal back then in that culture, and and something happened. Historians say something happened relationally between the two, and Onesimus runs away. He, and he leaves, and he ends up going to Rome. He wants to disappear. Big city, a lot of people. I, I'm running away from my past. I want to disappear so nobody knows where I'm at because where I was at, I had nothing going for me, so I just want to get off of the grid. So he leaves Colossae and ran to Rome for a brand new life to just disappear. And in Rome, somehow he crosses paths with Paul. While Paul's in chains, he leads Onesimus to faith in Christ. So he becomes a transformed follower of Jesus, sees the purpose and plan of the kingdom, becomes a part of the team, and now Paul's sending him back. He's sending him back. Talk about friction that might occur when Onesimus walks in the door. Onesimus with his, with his bag with letters. And it's like there's a lot of relational tension that could be had there, but God wants us to see a bigger picture. So the Holy Spirit actually leads Paul to write another letter. So he's already written a letter to the church in Colossae, but he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's relational friction. You and Philemon got some stuff going on. I need to write another letter. That letter in our Bible is called Philemon. Wonder who that's to. Little footnote about the church, by the way, is that that there's always going to be relational friction. The enemy wants you to think that when you step into a gathering like this, that everything should be perfect and there'll never be relational friction. Can I tell you what relational friction is? It's people problems. People problems. So the church will always have relational friction unless the church doesn't have any people. Then you're, then you're free of it. You're good. 
So let, I'll, I'll put myself in this example, but I'll also put you because I'm, I'm people. You're people. So if I'm in the church, guess what we're going to have? Everybody, one, two, three. I heard people. We're going to have people. I heard friction, and I heard people problems. All three are correct, by the way. If I'm in the church, we're going to have people problems. If you're in the church, there's going to be people. There's going to be relational friction that, that has to be dealt with and walked through. There's going to be people problems, but by the power of the Holy Spirit and the transforming power of Christ, there should be a way to walk through people problems. And I've experienced this. You actually become stronger in your faith as you walk through them and not run away from them. So God gives us a letter to work with through some relational friction, Philemon. It's a short one-chapter book in our Bible, essentially to do the same thing Onesimus did that uh, for Onesimus that Barnabas did for Paul. We talked about that last week. Barnabas vouched for Paul, making his ministry possible. Well, Paul, in his letter to Philemon, he's leading Philemon in understanding that Onesimus, these are great names, by the way, is now different, and he wants the people to know because, why? There's something at stake here. Onesimus could show back up in Colossae and be thrown in jail or even executed. So Onesimus, this is not me and you carrying a letter. This is, not, this is not me carrying a letter down the road to somebody. This is someone, this is Paul looking at Onesimus and Tychicus and going, I want you to carry this. And Tychicus is like, I don't know what the big deal is. And Onesimus is going, I know what the big deal is. I'm from there. I've been there. You ever been to my hood? I've been there. You ever been to Colossae? It's like South Johnson. I'm just kidding. Uh, that's... He's, like, he's like, I can't, I don't know if I can go back there. Like, I don't know, I don't know if, you know, Ty, Chikis, you didn't deal, Ty, you didn't deal with this. I've dealt with this. I know what's waiting for me. I know that if I go there, there's a guy named Philemon. So you got Ty, Oni, and Phil. I just thought of those names just real quick. You got Phil waiting for me over there that I ran away from. There's a lot of tension going on. So I don't know if I can actually, I don't know if I can do this. And Paul writes, Phil, Philemon, he says this in verse 15. He says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you. He's talking to Philemon about Onesimus. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Verse 16, no longer as a slave. So when he's coming back to you, Paul, which is considered an authority figure over Philemon. So if you read the whole book of Philemon, which is very short, it's actually kind of a funny book. Because Paul will say, well, I'm your boss but I don't want to boss you into this, but I will if I have to. It's kind of like, that's, what it, that's kind of what he says. But in verse 16, he says, no longer as a slave. He's different, but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he's a Christ follower, and he's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So he's vouching for Onesimus to Philemon going, he's different. He's, and, and because he's different and because of the gospel and because of what's happening right now in the church, you don't have to have the same relationship when he comes back. So he's, he's going ahead. He's using his power and, his, and leveraging, which that's a whole other sermon, you know, whatever influence you have, leverage it for someone else, right? Like he's using that in, in this moment towards Philemon. So Onesimus takes the letter to Colossae by faith or takes the letters, and this letter has now made it Thousands of years teaching and leading the church and guiding the Christian theology for centuries. Onesimus is written in the fine print of every church that Jesus has and is building that has dealt with relational friction and theological drift, which, by the way, is every single one of them. Every church, 100%, unless you have zero people, has an inside or outside influence going, well, do you really believe that? Well, yeah, it's written in the Bible. Yeah, but do you have to believe everything about? Well, you know, like, I get it. You have a personal, you have a, the, you deal with that with Jesus. I believe what's in God's word. You got people trying to influence you theology, theologically from the outside and from the inside, and you have relational friction. So every single one of them, and Onesimus carries the letters to Colossae that are going to help guide the church for thousands of years. And Onesimus plays an extraordinary role in the story of God, and we can learn a couple of things from Onesimus. Well, number one is this, don't ever count God out. 
Don't ever count God out. Just put yourself in his shoes right now. Onesimus left a slave, no rights, no place, no stance, no stake in life, no influence, no power, no control, or much possibility in life. He, he literally, his best, at this point in his finite thinking, his best possibility in life is that nobody knows him. That he just disappears off the grid. That's, that's his hope in this moment. Don't ever count God out. You may be in the depths today, limited in every way, but God sees you. And since God sees you, there's always a possibility for God to raise you up in a significant place in his story. You may think I'm at the bottom, so I'm going to run from my past. I've got a lot of stuff going on in my past and my history, so I'm going to run from it. I'm going to run and try to disappear. But God saw Onesimus the whole time, and God sees you. He sees you. He sees the very worst thought you thought and words you said. He sees every single bit of it and says, I still want to use you in the story of God on earth. He saw Onesimus the whole time. Don't ever count God out. If you were to tell, uh, just again, put yourself in his shoes. If you were Onesimus the slave and God was to come to you and say, hey, I know you're a slave, but can I just tell you, I, I need to help guide the church right now when it comes to theology and when it comes to relational friction. I need to help. I need to step in. So the Holy Spirit's working right now on a guy named Paul, all right? So you know Paul, okay? But, and I know you're a slave right now, but I need you to not only deliver these letters. Yeah, I know there's a lot of fear that comes in when you think about that because I know your story because I've seen you the whole time, Onesimus. But also, I'm going to use you to guide for the next thou the 2,000 years of church history. Onesimus would be like, who am I? I don't have any, I, I'm, I'm baseline zero. I don't have any influence on planet Earth. I'm a slave. Nobody listens to me. Who am I? Why would you use it? He wouldn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it. Don't ever count God out. Second thing is this. No role is too small in the kingdom we serve in. No role is too small in the kingdom we serve in. There's no such thing as God who is great asking you to do something that's insignificant. It may look small, but there's no insignificant asks from God. Everything that God invites you to do has significant potential in the kingdom of God. So never let the woe is me seed take root in your heart and in your life. So if you feel invisible, I'm telling you, if God has given you the role right now that you have, you have, listen to me, this is so important. If God has given you a role, even if it seems small, it seems like it's in the background, seems like it's in a fine print kind of place, all right, and you don't get a lot of visibility, can I tell you that you have all the recognition and potential you need to change the world? I believe this is what's going to happen after, after the 80, 70, 80, 90 years, that if, if I'm lucky, to live on planet Earth. I believe that because of what it says in Scripture, I believe I've given my life to Christ, and because of that, I will be in heaven one day, and I'll look back and realize that the moments that I spent trying to live my life only to reap the harvest of the time that I lived here would look absurd. It would look absurd in that moment. God says, I want you to live for something more eternal. So there's no role that's actually too small in the kingdom we serve. The world we live in has, does a really good job Show, acting like there are so many roles that are too small, not enough recognition, not enough visibility. And because when you step into those roles and you don't get the spotlight, you feel like people look at you and you go, well, it's insignificant, it doesn't matter. That's not how it works in God's economy. That's not how it works in God's plan. Everything that God invites you to has significant potential in the kingdom of God. Never let that thought attach itself in your heart. Imagine the moment after Paul, chained up, gets done writing his letters that we know now has shaped and guided the church for thousands of years. He gets done, stacks them up, looks around, and sees a couple of his most inner circle trusted guys, Tychicus and Onesimus, and says, hey, make sure these get to Colossae, and here's a special one, and make sure it gets to Philemon. 
All right, he, he's the only one that needs to read it. The whole church in Colossae needs to read this one, but Philemon can read this one by himself, private letter. All right, go do that. Go do that, God. I trust you with these are important letters. They could have said, because they were in the inner circle, right? One of the most faithful people on his team. They could have looked at him and said, are you kidding me? Are you joking? We've been here the whole time. We, you're, like, we're like your right and left hand dudes. Like We're with you. We're on the team that's in the inner circle. We've got the most trust. We're the people that hang out, like that plan everything. And all you want us to do is be the message boys? You simply want us to deliver letters in this moment? They didn't know. Check this out. They didn't know that it was going to become part of our Bible. They didn't know that what they were doing, literally what was in their bag, was going to influence billions of people over thousands of years. It was a letter to a church and a letter to one man, and Tychicus and Onesimus, being faithful, did what God invites us to do and says, if this is what is needed, if this is the role God's inviting me to play, then I'm going to be the best message boy they've ever seen. I'm going to be the best message boys they've ever seen. This letter is going to be in pristine condition when I get it there. And we're going to pray for the church as we go. In fact, in fact, I want, we want to do this in such a way that we're going to be able to train the rest of the message boys. We need more message boys. These letters are doing amazing work, and we need to be able to deliver them, and we need more people that we can trust to do it. They did it faithfully, and they never knew the weight of what was in the bag the whole time. The God-inspired, people-building, church-exploding word of God was in the message bag. No role is too small in the kingdom we serve. If God asks you to carry it, I want you to carry it like you're carrying the very message of Christ, because you are. If God asks you to be a kid's check-in host, don't look at that as a role that's like, man, this, I don't know, this doesn't get a lot of visibility. It's kind of beneath me. No, no, no. You're welcoming families and checking in future leaders and business owners and pastors and future moms and dads that have generational impact for years to come. And the way you check them in helps carry the message of Christ. It's not just in the church world, though. The way you are in your job helps carry the message of Christ to your employees or to your coworkers. The way you care, the way that you are in your school helps you care, helps carry the message of Christ to your other classmates or to the people that are in your dorm or to the people that you see in the hallway or in the cafeteria. The way you are on your team, if you're on a team with somebody, you're on a baseball team, a tennis team, a golf team, it doesn't matter. The way you are helps carry the message of Christ to your teammates. So act like you're carrying the message of Christ. You know why? Because you are. Because you are. So when God says, I'm going to put you on the tennis team, he didn't put you on the tennis team simply to be the best tennis player. He said, you got something in your message bag that not everyone on your tennis team has. And guess what? You may not know the weight of it, but it's a message that can free people and bring dead people to life. So I'm putting you on the tennis team. They didn't know the weight of what they were carrying but he's saying to them and he's saying to me if God asks you to carry it carry it like you're carrying the message of Christ so what looked like a little insignificant ask changed your life and it changed mine the letter to Colossae and the letter to Philemon changes is changing our life and changing your life because we've been guided by it theologically and relationally for years and this is so neat history tells us that Onesimus was responsible one of the people responsible for collecting all of Paul's letters. Most of the New Testament, by the way, is what that is. So he just collected all the letters, got them together, and he was one of the guys responsible for delivering them to the early church fathers, which then ended up delivering it to the guys that said, all right, we need to go through these letters, and we need to put together what we're calling the, the, the canon, which is what they called the scriptures and it was the thing that we could look at and 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 they would they would take a rigorous process of figuring out what letters needed to be in this book that we call the bible that we call the word of god that's living and actually has the ability to transform your life when you live by it onesimus gathered these letters and handed them up never knowing that one day northridge community church was going to be talking about him that Onesimus was written into the fine print of every church that opens up the word of God and uses it for theological direction and relational direction 
Isn't that incredible? At the, at the time, it may have seemed insignificant, but God used it in an extraordinary way. And you can go ahead and stand up. We're about to enter into a time of worship. So here, here's the question I want to leave you with. What role is God inviting you to play in his kingdom? What role is God inviting you to play in his kingdom? Where is God inviting you to connect your life so that you can help bring the message of Christ to people. Can I tell you this? We've seen God do extraordinary things in the life of our church. We've seen God do extraordinary things. I've talked to pastors and church leaders that are, their, their church since 2020, since all that stuff happened, their church has closed their doors or split or they're trying to still meet but they lost their leaders in the process. And God continues to be faithful. And, and, and we've seen God do extraordinary things. But what he's building here has never been about a few visible leaders. It's always been about the sacrifice and the working through the hearts of the many. It's never been on the back of a few visible people. It's never been that way. And I promise you, as long as I'm here, as long as you've got the leadership you have, it will never be that way. Because it was never supposed to be that way. What he's building here, it's never, it's never operated in that way. And so what I want to do is I want to ask you to move from being someone that's always having the door held open for you to experience Christ. And I want to ask you and invite you to be a part of the inner circle, a part of the team. Somebody that says, you know what? I'm going to start holding the door for other people to experience Christ. I'm going to be start, I'm going to start being someone that holds the door for others to experience Christ. And here's the supernatural thing that happens in the midst of this. I promise this, and, and people will say it doesn't happen, and, and I, I will argue to, the, to my deathbed. Is that when you attach your life to something, it doesn't have to be visible, that helps hold the door for others to experience Christ, you yourself begin to experience Christ in a way you would not have otherwise experienced. All of a sudden, you're on a team with people, and you start to get to know some people. You're like, I didn't know their names, but now I do know their names. I didn't know they had kids, and now I do know they have kids. All of a sudden, that person asked me to pray for their kids. I've never prayed for their kids a day in my life. I've never prayed for anyone's kids. I guess I probably should throw out a prayer on Monday morning. Forgot, so I'm going to do it on Tuesday. Forgot again, I'm going to do it on Wednesday. Keep forgetting, I'm going to text them, say, and ask them how they're doing. And then they texted me on Thursday and asked me how I'm doing. And then there's a director over that team and they they keep asking me how I'm doing and all of a sudden you realize you're part of a family of people that care about people and all of a sudden you're like I didn't know it was going to be like this because I kept holding holding off because I didn't think I had the schedule to do it I didn't think I had the time to do it I didn't think I had the resources to be a part of the team I didn't think that I, I knew what my schedule looked like and I couldn't put any more in and so all of a sudden we took God out of the equation but when you step in by faith and by obedience God goes stop taking me out of the equation because I do this thing with fish and loaves you ever heard about it I multiply it out pretty easily pretty quickly and I want to do the same for your life so I invite you to be a part of the team and see how God uses you. And we can learn from Onesimus. You can't ever count God out. And there's no role too small in the kingdom. And I'll leave you with this. We never know what God's able to do on the other side of obedience. Pray with me. God, light our hearts on fire. Light our hearts on fire for what you want to do through us. Help us be encouraged and energized and fueled by stories like Onesimus. I, I, I bet $1,000 that Onesimus had no idea the impact he was going to have on the church at large. But that's how you work. So God, we want to be a part of your story on earth. We love you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I think it's interesting in the story that I believe what Onesimus would have done anything that Paul asked him to do. He would have gone anywhere, just whatever. I mean, no questions asked, just like, because he loved Paul. He trusted Paul. But I think it's interesting that Paul asked him to go to the one place that he really didn't want to go, to return to the place where, like, there were hard feelings and, and tension, like Johnny talked about earlier. 
you know, I, I think that there are probably people in this room that feel that way about like what God's asking them to do right now. You might feel like God's asking me to do the one thing right now that I really don't want to do. And maybe maybe there's some fear involved. But as, as we sing this song in response to what we've heard today, let's just pray for a deliverance, a deliverance from fear to faith and that we would just every day just surrender our lives to whatever it is that God has for us. Standing on the edge of everything I know, comfort is behind me. I've got to let that go. There's freedom in the free. Falling into you. God knows where I'm going. So maybe I don't have to. I lay me down.
I know when it comes to taking steps of faith, there can also be a lot of fear. And, and I, have this, I have this thought, a lot of times we think fear is the opposite of faith. But actually the opposite of faith is certainty. So I actually think that there can't be any faith unless there's actually a little bit of fear. That faith is impossible if fear is completely gone. And so here, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to take a step of faith even if fear is present and in the room. To say, you know, if, if, you're not, if you're not someone that, if, if you're someone that's like, yeah, I, I think it's time for me to take a step, join the team, be a part of what God is doing here, then, then, and I know there's going to be some fear there. Like, what if this, I've never done that, I've never been a part of that, what if, what if that, what if relational stuff happens? Yeah, yeah, that stuff happens. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, and by the transforming power of the message of Jesus, we can walk through those times and walk through those things and actually be built stronger because of it. So here, here's what I'm asking you to do. If, you're, if that's your next step, I want you to grab this card. And by the way, if you're new here, you grab this card. If you're someone that needs a prayer request, grab this card. If you're someone that's like, man, I've got a next step, like the one we're talking about right now, grab this card, fill it out, and put it in the connection card box next to Exit Auditorium. But but if you're like, that is my next step, I want you to take it. I want you to put your first name on the front. And I want you to put the words, I'm in. I'm in on the back. And I want you to put it in there. And I promise you, I'll, I'll reach out to you personally and say, look, here's, thank you, first of all. And then we're moving forward. And God, you never know what God's going to do on the other side of a step of obedience. God, light us on fire for you. Let our lives, let our hearts just absolutely explode for your message and for your son Jesus. And let our lives bring glory and honor to you this week as we, as we head out of this place. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen, amen, amen. Have a great rest of your week, church.